I'm Bob Campbell, a retired partner with the uh, firm of Hodges, Dowdy, and Carson. And I'm here in connection with a legal history project of the Knoxville Bar Association. Our project uh, uh, activity today will be an interview of Robert Worthington, a partner in the uh, Baker Donaldson firm. And uh, this will be part of the uh, archives of the legal history project of the Knoxville Bar Association. We'll now proceed with the interview. Would you state your full name, please, sir? Robert F. Worthington, Jr. And uh, where do you live now? I live in Knoxville. Where um, did you grow up? I grew up in Clinton. And where and when were you born? July the 17th, 1931, in Knoxville at the old uh, hospital that had only been opened, Fort Sanders. No, it wasn't Fort Sanders. It was St. Mary's. Uh, the nursery, I'm told, was only had only been opened about a week when I was born. At, at, at St. Mary's Hospital? At St. Mary's, yeah. Well, that was closer to Clinton than Fort Sanders Hospital yes. would have been. Yes, yes. That's, that's right. Okay, and... Uh, <clears throat> You say you grew up in Clinton. Uh, who were your parents, uh, Bob? And I'm going to call you Bob. By all means. Yeah. Uh, who, who were your parents? Well, my father was Robert Sr. He went by Bob, too. Mm -hmm. My mother was Rachel Boggs, mm -hmm. B-O-G-G-S. Uh, she was born in... Uh, Lake City, or actually in Bryceville, mm -hmm. which is outside of Lake City. And when she was about 14 years old, she moved down to close to Oliver Springs to be with her uncle, who was uh, her daddy's uh, brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the head of the railroad in Knoxville. That, that was uh, her uncle. <clears throat> mm -hmm. She grew up with him after she was about 14. Okay. And your mother uh, was born uh, approximately when? Uh, a thousand... Around the turn of the century? Around the turn of the century, yes. Right. And uh, your father, of course, lived in Clinton. And what, uh, what business was he in? Dad's store was primarily shoes for uh, men, women, and uh, children. Mm -hmm. He had a uh, uh, Paul Parrot shoes, uh, and they also had some dry goods. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was uh, on the main street in Clinton? Yes, sir. Did you work in the store? Uh, From the time I was big enough to look up over the counter. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, uh, did, you, did you have any siblings, or were you an only child? Only child. All right. And uh, growing up, uh, uh, you said that you worked in the store. I did. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> where did you go to school? Uh, let, let's just start out with grammar school. I went to Clinton Grammar School. And uh, then from there, uh, uh, what was the next step in your education? I, I went to Clinton High School my freshman year. And then I went to Castle Heights Military Academy down at Lebanon uh -huh. uh, my last three years. Uh -huh. And... Uh, uh, in other words, you... you you went to uh, uh, Castle Heights where you graduated. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, high school diploma from yes, Castle sir. Heights. And then where uh, where did you go to college? I went to Maryville College uh, for one year. And then I went to UT. Mm -hmm. That was not the original plan. The original plan was to go to Maryville for two years to go to... Uh, uh, Yale 
for two years and back to law school at uh, uh, Vanderbilt. And I told my father that Maryville was a good school, and, but that it just really wasn't a good fit. I thought I'd just go on to Yale for three years instead of two. And my father said, well, I believe if I were you, I'd think again. He says, it's going to be all I can do to afford to send you to Yale for two years, and I sure can't do it for three. <laughs> so you can go to UT next year if you want to. And I did, and my blood turned orange, and the thoughts of going anywhere else to school mm -hmm. left me. And uh, so I, I, I did undergraduate and law school at UT. Well, I, 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 I presume that you have never regretted uh, a Yale Vanderbilt education. But Not really. Yeah. I... Uh, uh, I'm sure I would have gotten an excellent education, uh, but uh, I, UT feels like home, did and still does. Okay. Uh, do you still have any kinfolk in Clinton, Anderson County? Well, yes and no. My great grandfather had a 1,500-acre farm up on the Clinch River below where Norris Dam is now, mm -hmm. he had 11 children. Mm. My granddaddy, one of those children, of course, had eight children. And I'm an only child. So the woods are kind of full of Worthingtons mm -hmm. out in Anderson County. Even though you were an only child, you didn't, you weren't short of Worthingtons to no, run around with. Not at all. Yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Now, uh, uh, you're married. Yes, sir. And uh, to Carol. Yes. And uh, uh, how many children do you have? We don't. Uh, Carol and I don't have any. How many children do you? Uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, you were married to uh, uh, Judy McCreary. Judy, who, and when did she pass away, uh, Bob? About 1994. Mm -hmm. Married to her for 42 or three years. How many children did you and Judy? Two, have? two girls, Betsy mm -hmm. and Kathy. And what are their ages or uh, approximate well, birthdays? Betsy, I believe, is 56, mm -hmm. and Kathy is 18 months younger. She's, uh, she may still be 54, but she's getting ready to be 55. How many grandchildren do you have? Four. Each one of the girls had two. Kathy had a girl, the only girl, and a boy. And Betsy has two boys. All right. Now, uh, we've gotten you uh, through law school, but uh, I'm going to back up here a little bit. and. Uh, because I am of the same generation as you, where uh, all of us uh, just presumed that somewhere in our uh, youth and development we were going to do some time in the military. Mm -hmm. What military experience did you have and when did you have it? <laughs> well, of course, I, I went to military school, so I, I, I got ROTC there. Uh, then I picked up ROTC when I got to UT and got my commission in about 52 or 3. Uh, I've told you the story about uh, going down to the uh, ROTC office and saying, uh, I know I've got two years of active duty and I'm ready to go. But I'm also ready to go to law school, and if I don't have to go right now, I'd rather not go until I finish law school. And the fellow says, well, don't worry about that. We'd rather have you as a lawyer anyway, so go ahead. So I did. I went to law school, and the next spring got my orders to go to Fort Benning. And uh, I went to back down to ROTC and reminded them of that conversation. And 
The answer I got was, we don't know who told you that. Get your fanny down to Fort Benning. So Judy and I decided instead of waiting, we'd go ahead and get married, and we did mm -hmm. that fall. I was, uh, I, I, I got uh, uh, infantry school training. I was assigned to the uh, uh, 3rd Infantry Division, 7th Infantry Regiment, 4th Battalion. I was an 81 millimeter mortar platoon leader, and uh, I spent two years there at Fort Benning. It was the, Cor the Korean War. <clears throat> But they were sending, they were sending, the things were winding down. They were sending people home instead of sending folks over. So you spent your entire military career in uh, Fort Benning, and then uh, when you were released from active duty, you still had some law school. I still had two years of law school. All right. Uh, <clears throat> What caused you to be interested in being a lawyer? Good question. I think, yeah, you know, the first thing I wanted to do was be a, a soldier. This is back when I was 10 years old. And then I decided that, nah, I, I think I want to be a lawyer. And I'm not sure exactly why. I think the lawyers, at least in Clinton, were fairly uh, uh, well respected. They wore ties and suits, and they they argued for a living, and 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 so that's when I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. And they wore wore felt hats in the winter and straw hats in the summer. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, now, <clears throat> now I, 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 we may come back to that, but those were all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. But you asked me why I decided to be a lawyer, and mm -hmm. I decided for the, what are basically the wrong reasons. Well, uh, when you got out of law school, and when did you graduate from law school? In June of 1957. Uh, having uh, graduated myself about that time a year earlier, uh, there weren't a uh, there were there were not an overabundance of available jobs for law graduates at that time. Uh, how did you find a place to practice law? Pure luck, good luck. Uh, Howard Baker's late wife, my late wife, were in a wedding for Howard's cousin, Helen, who married Jack Dance. And so uh, I met Howard uh, in a connection with that wedding. Turns out he was opening an office in Knoxville and was looking for somebody to... Uh, come and man it, and uh, we kind of hit it off after I told him I was a Democrat. Baker, typical of Howard Baker, said, I don't care what your politics are. I just care what kind of lawyer you are. Uh, I should say early on, Howard Baker is my best friend. Uh, best lawyer I've ever known and probably the best guy. Now uh, at that time uh, <clears throat> Howard uh, until he met you did not have an office in Knoxville. That's right. He had and an the, office in Huntsville and where his grandfather had opened an office in I think it was 1888. Mm -hmm. 
Was any other were there any other law, active lawyers in that office at that time? Only his uh, father, who was in Congress, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and that's the firm. The, the name of the firm was Baker and Baker. Uh, and uh, his father was in the firm, but he obviously, mm -hmm. I guess obviously, did not practice. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, <clears throat> so you and Howard opened an office in Knoxville. Where, did, where was your first office in Knoxville? On Gay Street, on the second floor of the old... Fidelity Bankers Trust Company. Fidelity Bankers Trust Company. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I spent two days a week in Huntsville, mm -hmm. and Howard spent two days a week in Knoxville, mm -hmm. and we planned it so we were always together instead of mm -hmm. apart. <coughs> Starting out uh, in that uh, uh, relationship. Uh, uh, you and Howard Baker, uh, two lawyers, and we'll get through this a little bit later, but there's a few more than two lawyers in the firm now, aren't there? Yes. Uh, jumping ahead, and then we'll come back to the two lawyers. How many lawyers are in the Baker Donaldson firm now? I believe there are 660 lawyers in all of the offices. In Total. 17 offices in seven states All right. in Washington. All right. Now, what uh, starting out with uh, with Howard uh, Baker, uh, what kind of work did you do? Took everything, like everybody else, we took everything that came in the door. A small town lawyer. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I. We took some criminal cases. Mm -hmm. Howard was a very prominent criminal lawyer, among other things. Uh, I don't remember him ever trying a, a criminal case in Knox County, but he tried several up in Scott and mm -hmm. uh, surrounding counties up there. And uh, I tried a few criminal cases uh, as near as I can remember, they were all appointed mm -hmm. cases. Uh, I, uh, I guess it was good experience. I, I didn't particularly enjoy the criminal cases, though, because I felt sorry for the people who, for the most part, just couldn't cope. They couldn't manage. Uh, but we tried a little bit of everything else. And uh, you tried cases in Huntsville and in Knoxville? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we represented uh, uh, insurance companies. So we went to court in uh, Crossville and Jamestown and uh, uh, all over. Northeast Tennessee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Interesting, I think, you and I have discussed this, uh, it was not uncommon uh, to try two jury cases in the same day. And once, Howard and I tried three <laughs> jury cases in the same day. Uh, we would have always interviewed the plaintiff, and if there were important other witnesses, we generally would have interviewed them ahead of time. Uh, other witnesses, frequently, we interviewed uh, at the courthouse and went in and tried to case. Tried to case. Who, was the, uh, who was the circuit court judge in uh, Scott County when uh, you started practicing up there? Bill Davis, I think. Co uh, judge W.I. Davis. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, now Judge uh, Davis was was an excellent judge. Yeah, he had a a practice of inviting the lawyers to go to lunch with him, mm -hmm. which I always thought was mm -hmm. was was very nice of him. 
He was a real gentleman. Yes. All right, now, uh, Bob, Bob uh, <clears throat> in time, of course, your practice uh, uh, flourished, and uh, uh, Baker and Baker uh, took a different name and joined with some other lawyers. Is that correct? After probably not much more than a couple of years, <clears throat> excuse me, it got to be apparent that one and one in two different cities was not a very efficient way to practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had discussions with some other firms and ended up merging with Robert and Lindsay Young. Mm -hmm. And the firm became Baker, Young, Young, and Baker. And how long did that association continue, approximately? Not long, four or five years. Okay. It was a very friendly party, and it was a very friendly relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it wasn't a good fit for them, and it wasn't a particularly good fit for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, just before Howard was elected to the Senate, mm -hmm. and that would have been in 1966, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, we left, as I say, had a friendly parting with Robert and Lindsay Young and former Baker Worthington. And when Howard went to the Senate, we had six lawyers. When that, Howard, Howard came back from the Senate, we had 96 lawyers and three offices. And that was uh, still under the Baker Worthington uh, uh, heading. Yes. Now, um, as I recall, uh, Howard Baker served in the Senate for three terms, which would be 18 That's right. years, and that means he uh, came back in 1984. No, he was uh, President Reagan's chief of staff. Yeah, that was four. later, but in the Senate, he left the Senate in 1984. Uh, that sounds about right. And, and at that time, the firm was... The Baker Worthington yes, firm. Yes, yes. Right. And uh, at, at that time, uh, what was the full name of the of the uh, oh. firm? Don Stansberry became a name partner. Bob Crosley became a name partner. Lou Wolf became a a name partner. Baker Worthington, Crosley, Stansberry, and Wolf. Okay. And I may, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody, but uh, All right. anyway. And uh, yeah. you're, uh, <clears throat> as you have told us, uh, that that practice uh, grew to the point where you added uh, a lot of lawyers. And we uh, had about in 1994, mm -hmm. uh, which was not that long afterwards. We had about 125 lawyers and five offices. Mm -hmm. We had an office in Nashville, Knoxville, Johnson City, Huntsville, and Washington. We had a Washington office. Uh, Washington, uh, Washington D.C. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And uh, uh, over this period of time, and. Uh, uh, as we know now, uh, the firm is Baker Donaldson et yes, al. Yes. Before that transition was made to the Baker Donaldson uh, uh, name, uh, just in a general way, the type of practice, the type of work that uh, uh, the firm did and the type of work that Bob Worthington did, how did that develop? Well... I'm not, I don't remember that we did any criminal practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember we did any divorce practice. But we did a fairly broad-based business practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a, we represented insurance companies. Uh, and uh, my practice 
went from being manager took a fair amount of time. You were managing partner. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but I, I, I counted up not long ago that for the first several years of our practice, I've tried something over 350 lawsuits. That goes back to your two lawyer Huntsville, Knoxville. It goes all that goes goes that far back. Yes. Let, let but, me interrupt you just a little bit, and then we'll get back on track. Uh, when you started in 1957 with Howard Baker, uh, what was your pay? $275 a month. And you were thrilled to get it, weren't you? Yes. Uh, uh, Judy and I bought a house, uh, and our monthly payments on a house were $60. And we got by comfortably uh, on that. That was not far from what I made when when I was in the army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, all right, getting back to the development of uh, of the practice, and we're we're up at the, at the Baker Worthington uh, level now. Uh, you say you don't remember criminal work. Uh, what kind of work were you doing? Well, I was doing trial work up until about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's, I haven't tried a lawsuit. I, I don't mean that I haven't been involved, but I haven't been in court mm -hmm. trying a lawsuit for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't take anything for it, mm -hmm. for the experience, uh, but I don't want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Howard and I used to say we could try any circuit court jury case for $500. Mm -hmm. With inflation, that's probably $5,000 today. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, you couldn't touch a circuit court jury case for $5,000 anymore. The combination of... of uh, Settlements uh, and the uh, have made have made that area of practice much much more important. And uh, uh, how has the general trial practice? changed in the course of uh, your career uh, from the Huntsville early days, uh, Knoxville, uh, to uh, the time when you stopped trying lawsuits. Uh, when you started trying lawsuits, was there such a thing as discovery? Gosh, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's I would not argue that discovery is not crucial and important to trying a lawsuit, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, in those days there was no such thing, and uh, uh, discovery is kind of a mixed blessing. It adds an awful lot of expense mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. trying a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it provides information that could be essential to winning or losing the case. How many, uh, when, you, when you and Howard opened your little office in Knoxville, uh, 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 did you have a copy machine? Uh, there wasn't any such thing. Did you have a fax machine? There wasn't any such thing. There wasn't even an electric typewriter. Now, soon after, we got the copy machine, you know, where you put a, go in, make a negative, and then mm -hmm. take it out, and, and then put it under another. I think they call that a Verifax machine. I think maybe you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right, yeah. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> all right, when you quit trying lawsuits, uh, uh, or uh, gradually as you gradually yeah. got out yeah. of trying lawsuits, uh, uh, you, you got into more into the corporate transactional field, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. I uh, uh, I drafted. This is going back before the time of your question, but I drafted the original charter for the Tennessee Gas Association mm -hmm. in 1962. Mm -hmm. And I, so to speak, graduated. Uh, actually, as I say, I drafted it. Howard uh, handled that work, but uh, uh, I kind of graduated. I've been general counsel. Mm -hmm them for, I don't know, the last 20 mm -hmm. years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee Valley Industrial Committee, which is TVA's uh, direct sale customers, uh, we, we pay TVA about $11 billion, $800 million a year, about 13% of TVA's total power production. And uh, uh, as I say, they are the direct sale customers. And I've been representing them for 15, 18 years. Uh, Don Stansberry, I picked that client up when Don left to go work for John Rollins. And uh, I've done a, uh, a, a little bit of corporate business work. Uh, uh, today, when we've got, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when you've gotten big, uh, I've, I've, I've done six or eight securities registrations. Uh, I've done work uh, in, in appearing before the Public Service Commission in, in Washington. Uh, uh, whatever it is they call their public service commission up there. And, and uh, uh, I've done, you know, I've done that kind of work. <clears throat> Today in this firm, as big as it is, part of the plan was to be able to have an expert in almost any field. Mm -hmm. But so many of the things that I'm working on today will have several different areas of practice involved. And so I spend time putting teams together. Mm -hmm. And I may not be nearly as confident uh, in the area of practice, but I've been there, I've done that, and I know how to manage and, and make use of it. A part of that, uh, is it not? not uh, the ability to identify <clears throat> the best people to put in positions yes. on the team. Yes, you got them. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of brings us to uh, uh, another general area, how the, uh, the, uh, uh, the development of law firm organization and administration over, over your uh, uh, career uh, uh, and getting into the uh, over the last fifteen or twenty years, uh, uh, you you having been a managing partner of a big firm <clears throat> and involved now in a big firm, uh, how how has how has that changed over the years? The, uh, it's changed dramatically, and it's in the process of changing again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I started practice. Uh, the word was when somebody comes in, you reach up in the air and pick a number and say, okay, I'll do it for a fixed amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of truth to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, in some cases, they'd have to know a little bit more about the case and, and that sort of thing. But, but to be honest about it, most of the fees were an educated guess about how much time mm -hmm. it would take or should take 
to try the case. Uh, we were the first firm in Knoxville to keep time on an organized basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember Abraham Lincoln said that time is a lawyer's stock in trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we did that on an organized basis. And our firm and the Fowler firm, I think, were the first two firms to start charging by the hour, mm -hmm. so that the basic legal fee—that <clears throat> don't mean, excuse me—that doesn't mean that fixed fees went entirely away, mm -hmm. but mostly fees mm -hmm. became a multiple of how many hours mm -hmm. were spent times the hourly rate of the lawyers mm -hmm. who were billing for their time. And, uh, and, and and so uh, firm administrative <clears throat> management became an important part. Oh yeah, of the development of, of your your, yeah. your law firm. How long were you managing partner of the? Uh, well, firm? <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> um, I guess. It was about 66, mm -hmm. close to the time Howard went to the Senate, until 94 when we merged uh, to put Baker Donaldson mm -hmm. in place. Okay. What are some of the uh, things that uh, are still developing? in the management of a law firm, and specifically in the area of uh, client relationships, budgeting, and that sort. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about the transition to hourly billing. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the, the, the word frequently from the client is, you're crazy, I'm not gonna sign a blank check. I got to know how much this is going to cost. And so we've got a section in the firm uh, that will do budgets. And, and we're not the only law firm that's doing that. I mean, that's where the trend, I think, is going. Figure out what has to be done, how much time it's going to take to, to do it, and uh, the, the right estimates about what will be involved in getting the case done and uh, issue a, a proposal to a client. Now it's, it's not usually black and white, it's not usually X dollars, but at least it's, a, it's an intelligent estimate of what, what it will take to get a case taken care of. That's a little different from... Uh... <clears throat> representing clients in Scott County in 1958. It's very different. <laughs> now, you've, uh, uh, of course, had a long and, and uh, illustrious legal career, but as a part of that, um, uh, what are, uh, I, I know that you've been involved in a lot of community activities. Yes. Uh, I know that you have confessed uh, from the word go of uh, being a Democrat. Uh, have you been involved in Democrat politics uh, at all? Yes. Uh, I've told you the story about a friend when I was still in a clerk at Ambrose and Wilson and in law school. Uh, and uh, a friend wanted to support somebody who was going to run for sheriff on a nonpartisan ticket. And I went to see Bill Wilson, who was my mentor. And Bill said, Well, the thing about these nonpartisan races and candidates is they don't last. And uh, he said, If you want to have some influence, Decide, first of all, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. 
and then go to the party. They're crying for volunteers. And uh, uh, that way you are not only making a, contrib a contribution, a real contribution, but you're making contacts. And uh, as you and I have talked, I followed his advice. Uh, the first job I got with the Democrats was to be a, a worker in the polls. Mm -hmm. And then I got to be in charge of that particular office. Uh, then I got to be on the board of the Democrat Election Commission. And then I got to be president of the uh, uh, Knox County Young Democrats. And ultimately, I was a candidate. I don't mean a candidate. I was a, a member, a delegate to the 1968 Democratic Convention for president. Uh, I, I, but, but as much, probably a lot more than politics, I've been involved in civic activities. And, and, and I think, I, I don't think politics is unimportant. If I had it to do over again, I'd do it again. But, but it's, it's not enough by itself. Uh, you have a long list of involvement in community and civic matters. Uh, give, give us an example of uh, uh, a couple of uh, positions in on, the, on civic matters that were <clears throat> especially gratifying to you. <clears throat> well, one uh, thing comes to mind. Uh, I was on the Chancellor's Associates at uh, UT, and uh, uh, as I recall, the term was about two years, and I had dinner on the last night of my term with uh, Joe Johnson, who was the president then, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, this has really been interesting. I've learned a lot about the university and how it works, and, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what am I going to do with it? And he said, Bob, it's just an investment. He says, we need to get as many people involved who know something about this, and that'll take care of itself. Well, about a year later, or two maybe, when Lamar Alexander was governor, he called me and said, Bob, there is a vacancy on the Higher Education Commission. And they tell me I have to appoint a Democrat. So I guess it might as well be you. Your turn. Huh? So I, I've always thought of, of uh, Joe Johnson's remark about it being an investment. So for nine years, I was vice chairman of the Higher Education Commission. And All right. And I enjoyed that a lot. I believe, uh, weren't you also involved with the uh, 1982 World's Fair? I was general counsel of the uh, World's Fair, and I was also on the executive committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the... Uh, Fair came about initially, I think, through the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they had had a World's Fair just a few years earlier uh, uh, out west. I'm embarrassed to say uh, the, the name of the city is not coming to me, but uh, but we made a trip out there. We made a visit out there mm -hmm. and uh, to see what was involved, see what the prices were and whether it was worth it. Mm -hmm. and came away uh, thinking that, yeah, you know, we might 
a little town like Knoxville, we might be able to have a World's Fair. And so it took us three or four years. I made, uh, I think it was four trips to Paris to appear before the Bureau of International Exposition. That was tough duty, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. It was, it was interesting in a lot of ways, uh, mostly obvious, but the thing that surprised me as much as anything, it, off the record, the conversation was always in English. Mm -hmm. When the hammer fell and the meeting began, it was all in French. <laughs> and there were translators, mm -hmm. uh, uh, translations coming over, and you had to sit there and listen to it that way. Okay, now, um, uh, you're uh, 81 years old. Yes. And, uh, uh, you uh, have had a long career in the practice, which is still going on. Who would you say, I know you'll say Howard Baker, but uh, who, who else other than Howard Baker would you say or uh, uh, people in the legal profession that have had uh, the greatest influence on you from the professional point of view? But you're right. Howard Baker is my hero. Uh, he's the best lawyer I've ever known. Uh, he's probably one of the best people I've ever known. Uh, and he and I are both lucky because uh, we were such a good fit. Uh, I was very strong in the administrative executive side of the practice and and in the management side, and and, uh, and 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 Howard, we couldn't have done any of this without Howard. I mean, he was. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, one person that was somewhat a lot of lawyers, a lot of senior lawyers, have been very influential. Uh, you know, more so than today. I think there was a lot of, of socialization between lawyers and Collegi uh, collegiality. Collegiality, is a good word. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still remember how the older lawyers were so interested in what I was doing and what was going on, and I couldn't figure out why. Now that I am an older lawyer, I understand. It's fun to be a mentor, and it's natural to be interested in what young lawyers are doing, and, and, and not really just lawyers, of course, but uh, I don't know. Uh, Ray Jenkins was a, I, I mean, I, <laughs> Ray Jenkins was a mentor of mine, of sorts, and, uh, and certainly a dear friend. Uh, he was a character, as you know. Uh, Bill Wilson certainly was. Uh, I'm sure there are several that I'm not thinking of that would fall into that category as well. As you uh, wind down your legal career, uh, what would you say... Uh, is the uh, the uh, essence of the law practice? The uh, thank you for asking me that. I, I, I as, as you probably remember, uh, I have come to believe that the essence of practice practicing law is problem solving and communication mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as I tell young lawyers uh, don't be surprised you have to have you have to be able in order to solve a problem to apply legal principles uh, to, to do that 
And uh, uh, but as I as I say, I've told you know, lawyers don't be surprised if clients are not especially interested in knowing what the law is. They want to know how are you going to solve my problem. Mm -hmm. And many times, communication with clients is much more difficult than it is with people on the opposite side. Mm -hmm of trying to persuade a client or convince a client that this is possible or this isn't possible and mm -hmm. we can go there but we can't go there and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's to me it is the essence of practicing law. If you had it to do over again Bob would you choose any other career? No I would not. As I said earlier uh, I chose to be a lawyer for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. but the problem solving is not only fun, but you're accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing something worthwhile, and I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you.